Got it. Okay, sorry. In comics, the wolf, the devil, the evil spirit, the bad man, the savage are always symbolized by Negroes or Indians. Since there is always identification with the victor, the little Negro, quite as easily as the little white boy, becomes an explorer, an adventurer, a missionary, quote, who faces the danger of being eaten by the wicked Negroes. Um, so this is from Black Skin, White Mass. One of, one of my hobbies is reading things and finding comics in the things that I'm reading and going, oh, good, good, good. So I can always hold on to them. Um, but of course, this quote demonstrates why representation matters. It reveals to its audience the, the conditions under which the world will receive them. Despite his desire to be the hero, Fanon understands not only that the world would perceive him as, quote, a bad man, but also that the world would expect him to perceive himself that way, right? Um, and of course, while scholars, including Fanon, including W.E.B. Du Bois, including others, sought to dismantle this double bind of race and objection, we still clearly have a long way to go, right? Of course, troubling representations extend beyond race um, and include matters of gender and sexuality as well as disability. Um, disability though, because it's not talked about as much, which way? Oh, because it's on Zoom again, there we go. Um, oh, and I just wanted to just share with you the lovely, um, because what, what of course could Fanon be referring to when he's thinking about himself in that way? And of course, um, we all know what he is referring to, um, this lovely classic in, in French, because that's his, that's his native language. Um, but okay, so disability is a term as vexed as race, um, but we need to have a bit of a better understanding. How do I make this thing go up? Yeah, yeah. That, that one? Perfect. So disability, um, and this definition comes from a colleague of mine at the University of Texas, Jose Alance. And he says, disability refers to a common aspect of living embodied existence centered on a physical and or a cognitive difference, as well as the social, cultural, architectural, and political responses to said difference. Right, and there's no funny gap in the in the in the book, but I put the gap there because that gap is super important. Right, it's the gap between the perceived fact that I have a disability and the way the world perceives me with my disability. Right, and so that gap is where disability moves from something merely personal to something that's always political and engaged in the world. Right. Um, and, but of course, and so I'm saying, I mean, some of you here are disability scholars. You're like, well, how can you say that disability is not as well studied or well theorized? But uh, remember, I come from popular culture um, and in popular, which, oh, I keep messing with the Zoom. Uh, okay, here we go. But in, in popular culture, um, certain manifestations of disability are just taken for granted, right? So we have the evil villainous Captain Hook and why is he evil and villainous? Because he's Captain Hook, he's not in his brand. Of course, that would make him um, a, a monster of a person, right? Um, but for me, more interesting is Elephant Man, not in its representation of disability, but in its persistence, right? It debuts in um, 1977. Um, it plays for five years, it debuts in London. It plays for five years, both here and in New York. There are revivals in 2002, another revival in 2014, and coming soon to a theater near you, another revival starring Bradley Cooper, right? Just what we need, Bradley Cooper, right? Um, and I say that in part, I want you to imagine a play where the lead character is supposed to be a Black person and they are played by a non-Black person. And then in the revival, and then in the other revival, and then in the other revival. Right, or a person who is supposed to be queer and they are being played in 1977, that's fine, but by 2014, it's not, right? But unless I miss something, Bradley Cooper's not disabled and yet he is being called upon to represent this iconic character, right? Sort of like Bradley Cooper will be the next Black Panther. Like, no, that doesn't work, right? Um, and so this is what I mean when I say that, that, that disability is under-theorized, it's under-theorized in part because we're not asking a question that seems basic in other kinds of representation. Why isn't a disabled actor playing this part, right? So here is sort of a clear example of the way that disability is marked and still continues to be unremarked, right? Um, and yet, 
if race is always evident and disability is overlooked, what happens when the two meet, right? What happens when a body is both raced and disabled, right? Um, and of course, this brings us to uh, the topic of our talk, Victor Stone, otherwise known as Cyborg. Um, and I know some of you in here are, are design students. And so I, I want you to think for a second about the ethics of creating a structural architecture for a human being, right? This is a blueprint that's supposed to, you know, this, I mean, and again, I'm, I am not a design person, so please educate me in the Q&A. But it strikes me that it's like, oh, this is weird, right? This is supposed to be representing his heroism, but actually it's representing his technology. It's representing literally his design and not himself, right? So I've always, that image has always struck me as off, right? Um, okay, but so I want to say a couple of things about, well, a lot of things <laughs> about Cyborg, um, but one of them is his incredible uh, pro proliferation, right? So Cyborg is not just, a. this was him in 1980 when he debuted, right? And it's important to sort of look at like the physicality of him and, and like how much of him is human and how much of him is not. Um, but Cyborg exists both um, in, so on my, uh, I guess on your left, this is Cyborg in the Justice League of America movie, the very popular movie series. On the right is um, Cyborg in the Doom Patrol. Um, here is Cyborg in a show for five-year-olds called Teen Titans Go. Um, and then on the other side is the same show, but for 13-year-olds called Teen Titan, right? And so he is sort of, he, he's, this, he's, this, he's every man and yet he's a cyborg, right? Um, and just to, you know, just to get even nerdier, um, it's important to, to reflect on the fact that this is, this is one, this is Warner Brothers DC, right? Warner Brothers DC puts out a bunch of things, including Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and yet they only seem to have space for one black character, right? Meanwhile, Marvel puts out a bunch of things, including the Avengers and Iron Man, and yet they seem, they have room for a whole nation of black people, right? And so there's also something really interesting about how many communities he's being made to stand in for, right? So he's sort of triple minority, right? Because he's black, he's disabled, and he's <clears throat> a superhero. Not, not, a lot, not a lot of them, even in fictional universes, there aren't a lot of superheroes running around, right? So there's a lot of interesting representational work being piled into this body, which is both visible, and as I said, thinking about disability, invisible at the same time. Right. OK, so um, my mentor is a woman named Rosemary Garland Thompson. Um, she's um, <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for her. And one of the things that um, Professor, Professor Thompson insists is that we need to think about disability through the lens of race. And so I want to be clear. She is not saying that disability is akin to race. She is saying in the same way that Fanon can understand the constructed nature of the representation he's seeing and take analytical tools to take it apart, we, not just we the disabled, but we the community need to do the same thing when it comes to disability, right? It's somewhat controversial and somewhat troubling, so I wanted to clarify. So this is, and this is you know, from extraordinary, she says, I want to move disability from the realm of medicine which is from the realm of the private, right? The personal I have an issue into that of political minorities to recast it from a form of pathology to a form of ethnicity, right? Again, she is talking about the analytics that create the space in which of course, oh, we can't have blackface today. Sure, so what political work was done to create the condition where we can't have blackface? But Bradley Cooper can play the elephant man? So what that, what that tells you is that the political work that has been done for one has not been done for the other, right? And so this is what she's calling for. She's calling for that kind of um, an address. And so um, now I love Rosemary, um, but she's missing one thing. And the thing that she's missing is, well, what about if it's both, right? What if it's both and? What if you are, what if you are black and disabled? What then? Right, you have to let you have to do that work and then do that work again. Right, so there's there's something vexed in it, and so again, I think that cyborg is sort of the perfect um, the perfect analytic to sort of unpack all of this messiness. Right. Okay. So, um, but I've been talking a lot so far about African American studies, about disability studies. What I haven't been talking about is comic studies. Right. 
Um, and that's because comic studies is terrible about dealing with race. Um, and to sort of demonstrate the flaw and the gap that I'm trying to fill here, um, I'm going to take you quickly through um, the sort of canonical text, and it's literally in the title, Understanding Comics, right? Um, and again, this is, this is a vital and important work. If you're curious about sort of the ways that comics works and how to theorize them, I can't recommend this highly enough. But if you want to think about comics and representation and all the issues I just laid out and race or disability, uh, not so much, right? Um, but I can fix that. That's, that's, that's what I'm here to do. So um, in chapter three, he said he talks about um, the universality of comics, which, you know, for all the scholars in here, anyone saying that something's universal, red flag, red flag, right? Um, he says, the ability of comics, this is Scott McCloud, the author, the ability of comics to focus our attention on an idea is, I think, an important part of their special power, both in comics and in drawing generally. Okay, that's fine. Another is the universality of, the, of cartoon imagery. The more cartoony a face is, for instance, the more people it could be said to describe. Um, huh. So if we're beginning here with one, and we, and we end with, and you can't really make it out, but it says in parentheses, nearly all, right? I don't know. I can think of some people in this room that that abstraction doesn't seem to represent, right? Some of us are gendered female. Some of us are just people of color. Like if you're starting with the square jawed white man at the beginning and you're trying to abstract to nearly all of us, that's not gonna cut it, right? Um, so he continues, by saying the cartoon is a vacuum into which our identities and awareness are pulled, I agree. You know who else agrees? Fanon, right? Fanon says at the beginning, yes, you, you see the cartoon and you wanna be in the cartoon. So of course, no problem with that, right? It's, it, so it's an empty shell that we inhabit, which enables us to travel to another realm. We don't just observe the cartoon, we become it. So of course, he's talking about the, the idea of affect, the idea of, of effective identification, of wanting to be the superhero. That's why you, if you walk around on a hot day, you see a bunch of guys in Batman t-shirts, right? Because they have this effective connection to the character, right? And some of them are Jamaican and some of them are Indian and some of them are Pakistani and some of them are white, but they're all got their Batman shirts on and down in Brighton at the beach. Why? For precisely that reason, right? You can get pulled into it, but what if that doesn't happen, right? And so this is the place where I, this is where I wanna make my critical intervention. So he says, you know, following his logic, thus when you look at a photo or a realistic drawing of a face, you see it as the face of another. But when you enter the world of the cartoon, you see yourself. So let's go back. Thus, when you, and this is me rephrasing, obviously. Thus, when you look at a white guy's representation, you see it as the face of an other. Not another, but separate those, an other. And when you enter the world of the cartoon, you are still apprehending an other, right? So therefore, so this is, a, I'm sorry, emphasizing, therefore, not the face of another, rather the face of an other. Meaning that as with Fanon, entering the world of comics creates a complicated disidentification, right? And if you know Jose Munoz, he has a whole, Thing about the about the process of disidentification, how the thing that repels you also pulls you forward. So, again, not to you know, the book is great. Scott McCloud is a, is a is a decent human being. He wasn't being actively malicious. He just you know didn't have the tools. So, um, for me, this is an important critical intervention to make because it now gives you the space to find out. So, what's happening when? <laughs> what's happening when um, a forty year old white guy and a 30 something, forgive me on the age, um, Puerto Rican guy decided to create this disabled black superhero. Like what is at stake here, right? Um, so that's what we're going to you know, begin to un unpack, right? Um, and again, when I read comics, I, it's, it's often interesting to me how often comics anticipate things that are happening. This came out in 1982, this comic. Um, Teen Titans is set in New York City. Um, they're defending New York City, and of course, they're they're trying to keep New York City from becoming 
<laughs> it's like, how do they know? Um, anyway, so let's go back to the origins. Let's go, let's go back to quite literally ground zero, right? Okay, so, and this is, um, and this is, you know, he's talking here about his, about his life, and I'm going to actually do some reading instead of just talking. Um, Victor Stone, created in 1980 by writer Marv Wolfman and illustrator George Perez, um, has become an important and iconic character for DC due to his status as both Black and disabled. Indeed, as I showed you earlier, he's ubiquitous in popular culture. He's arguably the most ubiquitous DC character in popular culture because he's literally everywhere, right? Doom Patrol? He's not in Doom Patrol. If you read the comments, he's not in Doom Patrol, but he's in the show. Okay, sure, why not? Um, but his origins, Victor Stone's origins, defies easy, easy stereotypes surrounding race in the early 1980s, even as the text deploys more conventional tropes about the, about the disabled subject, right? So again, comics are um, multimodal, multimedia. They're, you know, how many different jokers do we have right now? You know, um, comics are always doing things. So I think it's important to always go back and look if you can, look at the origin. And so that's what we're doing here to look where did this character begin and what were the suppositions, you know, when he, when he started, right? Okay, um, and these are important and interesting for 1980 in New York City, right? Speak, speaking of, um, Victor's parents, Sil Silas and Eleanor Stone, are both PhDs. Again, 1980 New York City, um, who work in um, a research laboratory. And some of Stone's earliest memories are playing in the lab while his parents pursued their research. Simultaneously career minded and doting caregivers, Victor's parents homeschool him throughout his primary years, incorporating ex experimental learning techniques in a successful attempt to boost his intelligence while protecting him from the so-called tangle of pathologies that afflict less accomplished back Black families. Um, and that phrase, the tangle of pathologies, comes from the Moynihan Report, where he was talking about like what's wrong with you know Black people who live in council estates. All this, it's a tangle of pathology that keeps them there. It's not structural racism. It's their own fault, right? Um, and so, in a weird way, this comic is addressing that by giving him like God, the most perfect parents ever. Like your play, your your playground is is a lab. Right. And so here they are sort of monitoring his sleeping patterns to make sure he's his sleep is fully optimized here. You know, he's being quizzed about um, calculus. He's five, <laughs> but he's being quizzed about calculus, which, you know, I can barely count. So I would have appreciated that. But, you know, um, so anyway. I guess one might say, well, I won't, I won't make that joke. Um, <laughs> anywho, so, um, of course, given this style of parenting, Victor rebels, right? His parents are respectable PhDs. They live in a Harlem brownstone and he decides to become an athlete, right? The important thing though, is that this is a decision, right? He is, if he continues on this, on this path, headed to MIT, right? But he understands that I can make a choice and reject this kind of careerism. Right. Um, and so again, this 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 is a comic in 19. Like this is there's a lot sort of built in here about the pressures that successful black families were facing to assimilate and the pressures that they then passed on to their children. Right. So there's a lot going on here. Um, and so one of the things, because they live in a beautiful Harlem Brownstone, he meets um, when he's 13, a young brother on the corner, Ron, Ron Evers. You know, and of course we can see by the by the use of, of sort of um, street slang, what they call you boy, we can see that, oh, this is not the kind of person his PhD parents would approve him hanging out with, right? Um, and so again, as you can see here, Victor, I forbid you to run with those animals, the tangle of pathology again, right? Interesting, interesting language here. I don't, I didn't, I did not raise you to be shot down on some street corner. Right. What's left unaddressed, though, is why dual PhDs are living in Harlem in the first place. But of course, in 1980, we know the reason why dual PhDs are living in a all black neighborhood, because when they went to look for accommodations, they were steered to the place that they belonged. Right. Um, something that never happens in London, from what I hear. Um, anyway, um, so we have his response um, to them. 
and you know, um, you know, lots of late seventies, early eighties slang here, which is not for me important because this is pulp media, right? It's not supposed to be, it's not like the quality of the writing, but it's the themes that this writing is encapsulating, which I want to call your attention to. And he's like, save it, you know, you you guys are sellouts, you guys are just, you know, you're you're too much about your career. Um, and I'm, I apologize for the bad scan on this one, so I'm just going to read it. This is his mother. Um, don't dare give me any butts, Victor. Nobody took your hand and pushed you into this. Nobody but you. You wanted to go to public school? We let you. Um, you wanted sports? We didn't stop you. You could have gone anywhere, done anything. But you know what your problem is? You don't know what you want. Your father was right. There's anger inside you. But, but damn it, don't ever aim that anger at us, Victor. Aim it where it belongs, at yourself for ruining every opportunity you've had. It's like, oh, ma, really? <laughs> right. Um, so, but again, I think that this is um, some rather heavy handed commentary again on the stressors. Um, those of you who are old enough to be familiar with the Cosby show, not in like on Netflix, but when it was first coming out, you can sort of see all of all of that, all of those tropes playing themselves. Thank you. <laughs> We can see all of those tropes playing themselves out here several years before the Cosby Show even debuts, right? Um, and so, of course, he feels sheepish. He goes to track practice. Um, he comes back from, and by the way, his mother's like, you've ruined everything. This is terrible. He goes to track practice and there's a coach there um, offering him a full athletic scholarship to the University of Virginia, right? So it's like, oh, poor guy, you're gonna go to UVA for free. You ruined everything, right? Now, of course he didn't. And so he sort of, he goes to his parents' work um, and there's a horrible accident and the accident destroys most half, over half of his body. Um, but here's what's important though, right? To this point, Victor Stone is a fully three-dimensional character. He understands his position vis-a-vis -vis his parents. He understands his position vis-a-vis -vis his community. He's making certain choices and he's rejecting other things. Um, it's actually, you know, again, for Marv Wolfman, 40-year-old white guy from New Jersey, it's like not, not, not bad um, writing, um, sort of laying him out. But at this moment, the moment that he goes from merely being um, you know, a six foot two strapping black man, which is, has its own pressures, you know, there, merely from that to a disabled person that, and so here we see the, um, the process of rebuilding him. You can see all of the things. Um, and by the way, in this accident, his father survives the accident, but his mother is killed. So we have like the, 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 the tragedy that, that that's gonna, going to turn the wayward youth into the hero. Um, and we see him, you know, being rebuilt. But when he wakes up, he experiences a kind of objection, a kind of loss of self, right? And again, think about what the, what the creators are trying to do. They're trying to create this emancipated black figure and they mostly succeed until the very moment that he becomes something else. At that moment, he becomes a depressed and abject figure, right? Um, ah, wrong way. What just happened? Ah, yes. Um, I just wanted to pause and note, though, that the idea of Black Americans being imbricated with technology, competing with technology, and losing their soul has a long history. Um, one piece of that history is the, is the is the Southern fable of John Henry and the steam engine, where he sought to prove he was a man. Said, "I can out I can out outdo a steam engine digging into a mountain," which, of course, he does. Um, but at the end of the eight hour shift where he was literally this incredible, you know, figure is literally going with against a machine, he collapses dead. Right. And so there's there, there is a long history in the black community in America of this idea of of black masculinity being compromised when it comes into contact with technology. Right. So I just wanted to make that connection before I come back. Um, this is his high school sweetheart who, and as you can see, he has his, his, his hands around her and she basically says, she's mourned him. Oh, there was a horrible accident. You know, Vic's mom's died. He's in a coma. We don't know what's gonna happen. So she's moved on. But when he comes back as a Frankenstein monster, she's like, why didn't you just die? Which again, so we see how, and again, I'm not gonna talk about the, the, the character as character. I'm gonna talk about the character as representation. You can't imagine someone saying about someone black, oh my God, you're black now, why don't you just die? 
right? That's not a, even in 1980, that's not a thing, but you're disabled now. It's a normal reaction to be, you know, you, you should not, you should be put away, right? Um, and Rosemary Garland Thompson, she mentioned, she talks a lot about, um, there used to be laws that disabled people were not allowed to be out in the world unless they were covered and effaced, right? Um, and so this, I think, harkens back to that. Um, so I want to, I think, yes. So I want to pause here and say one particular thing, and this I think is really important. Um, Cyborg debuts in 1980, which is to say he debuts 14 years after, in America, the Civil Rights Act is passed. The Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights Act is the law that essentially grants Black Americans full citizenship, um, and it creates the conditions for people like his parents to even exist. But Victor Stone debuts three years before the patches of the American with Disabilities Act. And the ADA is an act that essentially said, hey, um, if Black people deserve certain consideration because of their history, we deserve certain consideration, accommodation, ramps, elevators, basic things so that we can fully function in society. If that's what law is about, it's about ending inequity, then, um, and I, I say this to say that 14 years is a long time for the language of equality and, and inclusion to sort of sink in, right? I mean, I think you guys are seeing that here when it comes to issues around gender, where it's like, no, 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 we want to take it back. Like, too late now. It's it's kind of sunk in. You can't you can't go backwards from that. But the ADA, this 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 new vocabulary around disability, ha is not yet a mainstream consideration. So for pulp comic book writers, they're not they don't have access to it. So instead, they have this. Oh my God, you're disabled. Go die. Right, that seems a logical thing for someone to say, right? So here, um, so he, um, and this is this is from several issues later. He is he cuts a brooding figure. He's isolated. He's always alone until, by happenstance, he comes across. Well, we can see here. Um, he's he's sitting um, under a tree um, because, incredibly, the, the the Teen Titans headquarters is in Central Park, which, like, what the hell? Anyway, um, so he's walking through Central Park. He's under a tree, and the ball hits him on the foot. He picks the ball up, and he gives the ball to the person, to, 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 the, to, the, to the cute little boy. He says, that's really neat. I wish they gave me one like that. And he's like, I mean, they only gave me a regular one. And he takes off his glove, and he also has a prosthetic, right? And so um, this is the act of recognition, which is also the act of healing, which is also, there's also this Florence Nightingale effect because the, the teacher shows up and of course she's this beautiful blonde, right? Um, and she is, and as, as, it said, as he says at the bottom here, someone pinch me and wake me up, right? So what is being described here is someone who lost a community because of, of his disability, discovering another community because of his, of, of his disability which is curious because dude, you're part of the Teen Titans, right? You live in this like cool ass building, you save the world, you go to outer space, Superman knows your name, right? You know, and you're sitting around like, oh, I'm disabled. Like it doesn't make sense or it only makes sense if we, if we conceive of race as something manageable and disability as something that can never really be overcome, right? Um, so a lot of a lot of narratives around disability focus on the cure, right? And so it's like, okay, so eventually there'll be a cure and you can go back to being normal because normal is what everyone should be, right? Um, and I'm gonna get into that in a second, but I'm just showing you here how suddenly he is enlivened by um this chance encounter, right? Um, and of course, it you know it doesn't hurt that she's a beautiful blonde, of course, right? Um and so he's so he's like, hey, let me play with the kids, he says. Because of course, this hits him doubly because again, he used to be a star athlete, right? It's like, but dude, you can literally jump a hundred feet in the air. You can't play sports with anyway, but that's a whole other thing. So he's gonna he's gonna play sports with the kids. Who's a stranger? My name is Victor Stone. They all know who you are, dude. The only one person <laughs> looks like that, right? And I'm Sarah Sims, their teacher. I don't get it. These kids go to a special school, which again, think about the idea that, that disabled people cannot be part of a mainstream. They have to be herded off to, and to learn among themselves. Um, um, they're, they're out here to, to, well, to relearn things, to show them they can lead a full life again. Some of them weren't so sure before. And so again, we have this sense, the inherent sense of objection that you can't 
say, well, shit, I lost my arm. Let's let's figure this out. You need like special spaces and special environments for that to happen, right? Um, so again, he finds this new community and this is supposed to be um, a sign of him, of his, a new accommodation, except it's not. Um, one of the frustrating things about comics is that, and so this is all the, the original team. This is all Marv Wolfman and George Perez. And if you are a super comic book nerd, you've read Crisis on Infinite Earths. Um, and you know that, that that was one of the better creative teams of the day. You know, it's like, if you want someone to write your show, you want Larry David to write your show. And, you know, so you, you, this, is as, this is as good as it's going to get. The writers who came after them, because on every comic, the comics don't end when the, when the original team leaves, they, who came after were not as talented and not as interested in exploring all these nuances and eh, you're disabled and you are miserable because you're disabled, right? Um, and so again, but, but a couple of things have happened here. It's weirdly, and, and to go back to all of the ways that he's, you know, JLA and Doom Patrol and Teen Titans for five-year-olds and Teen Titans for 15-year-olds, weirdly his status as a heroic black figure is untouched by all of this. It's just, except like, I didn't put it in the slideshow, but there's a scene of him walking through Harlem and it's like, oh, yeah, it's good to see you again. And like, he's the, the hero coming home. So somehow all of, all of this disability has not, has not affected how others see him as long as those others are part of the black community. Um, he's constantly being hailed as a great example for black people. And yet he doesn't seem to have access to that critical gaze when it comes to being a, a disabled figure, right? Okay, so. So here is another example of him, you know, sort of brooding. Now here he's not brooding because um, he doesn't have a community. Those are the very kids down there ice skating. Those are the very kids that he's been sort of chaperoning around. But um, of course, because you're, you know, 6'2 and you look like that, um, one of the villains kidnapped the entire class to try to get back at him, you know, and, like just, and so he's like, oh my God, I can't believe my affiliation with them put them in danger like I'm a horrible person, right? Um, and so this is sort of always his, his motif. Um, and this is several years later where uh, a, a worse writer and a worse artist to be, to be, to be clear, um, he is again pursuing a cure. He wants to be normal again, which is again weird, you're a superhero, but okay. He wants to be normal again. And it's important she says, I hope you want these new human looking plastic parts for the right reasons to please you, not someone else, right? And obviously the implication is clear that the problem is not with the disability, the problem is with how you see the world seeing you. And you can't adjust your mind to understand that the problem is not you, the problem is the world, right? And then begin to critique it in the way that, again, to go back to Fanon, Fanon at the very beginning is like, no, 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 I'm not the problem. The, the, the little Negro boy in Martinique is not the problem. The problem is the media telling him to think a certain, a certain thing, right? Okay, so um, a fun thing happened as comics got more popular. Um, they started letting black people write them. <laughs> and uh, this is David Walker. David Walker, um, uh, as you can see, he's um, obese. He has diabetes. And I think he has a stent, although don't quote me on that. Um, I'm just letting you know, so David Walker is a disabled black man, right? Diabetes, he has a stent, he's obese. He's got problems, physical problems. He's the first disabled black person to write the character, right? We're still waiting for, I guess when Bradley Cooper's done, we can maybe we can get a disabled person playing the elephant man on, on what do you call Broadway here? It's, um, thank you, in the West End, um, but you know, don't hold your breath. Um, so of course, when you turn a disabled character over to someone in a disabled community, he's like, well, wait a minute, this is bullshit. So his first story, um, it's, it says it right there, man inside the machine. It's like too much of, now mind you, he was created in 1980. This is 2014. <laughs> so we're talking 30 something years of aside from you know, his sort of opening arc, lots of sort of stereotypes and bad stories about him until finally they turned him over. Um, and again, I'm giving credit to the original team, I think did a great job given where they were before the ADA. The teams after that didn't seem to know. David comes along and he's like, no, 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 I got this. We're gonna fix this, right? Um, 
And he does. He creates a story, um, and this is obviously in part based on the Matrix. He creates it, and we've all seen the Matrix, please. Yes, I can just, all right. So he creates a story based on the Matrix where there's a techno virus. And in order to save the world, Victor has to absorb the techno virus into his own body. And in the process of doing that, it enables him to convert his metal parts to flesh and back again. So he can become Cyborg, the superhero, when he needs to be. And when he's not Cyborg, he can absorb the metal into his body and be normal, right? Um, so David Walker is a friend of mine. And so I was like texting with him back and forth. I'm like, man, that's, I'm so happy you did this. It's like so ridiculous. Um, and we're not even going to get into the, to the idea of the um, emasculated Black man, because of course, um, he's got this hot blonde girlfriend, but can he have sex with her? I don't think that stuff comes off, right? Um, but now it does. And so we actually see that here with his, now, and of course, David gave, her, gave him a Black girlfriend. So to sort, of, to sort of reverse the trajectory of the, oh my God, just die from before, from 1980, um, reverses, reverses the, the, the trajectory. And this is the scene where she comes in and discovers that not only has he saved the world from technovirus, it's given him this new ability. Oh my God, and she's, you know, and so we get to see, you know, these, this scene of affection. Um, but the problem with comics is something that I will call, and some of you know this term, retroactive, retroactive continuity, right? Um, which is tied into a term that Henry Louis, Henry Louis Gates talked about in The Signifying Monkey called the changing same, right? And what that basically means is that in comics, all the stories have to reset back, right? So Peter Parker never gets to be the hero in the eyes of the newspaper that hates him, right? Clark Kent can never just marry Lois Lane, have a couple of kids, drink beer, get a pot belly, you know, like, no, these things can't happen. It's always returning back to a sort of, a sort of neutral stasis point, right? So I loved David Walker's approach as a black man for obvious reasons. Um, it got some critical acclaim. Um, the next writer said, yeah, white guy, I don't like it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put him back. And again, I want you, I, I called attention to his character design at the beginning, right? Um, and those of you who know, know George Perez know that he's, a, he's an icon in, as an illustrator in the industry. Ever since Perez, he's gotten less and less human. Look at this. Right. So there's something, again, problematic about the idea that I'm only comfortable dealing with blackness if the blackness is somehow also inhuman and abject. Right. And that the moment that a black writer tells you you've been doing this wrong, you've been, you know, oversimplifying, you've been dumbing down the character, do it differently. The next literally the next writer. Right. And so for those of you, if, if those of you are friends with writers, you know that usually the, the, the text conversation goes one way. Hey, man, I write your stuff. I just think it's great. Oh, thanks. Oh, hey, so when are you going to put out something else? Oh, look for it at this point. Right. That's the relationship between a writer and a scholar. The scholar is like, I love your work. Please give, give me more. And the writer's like, dude, like, get away, get away. Right. But I look at my phone. I have seven messages from David. Oh, shit. I can't believe what they did. They put, I'm not gonna name the writer on the book. He's just gonna undo all the things I did. He's like so upset. And I'm just like, but of course it's this that even after, you know, the, what the first movie made a billion dollars and the second one also made a billion dollars. Like even after like the two Black Panther movies, even after supporting characters like the Falcon and um, War Machine, I'm talking now about on the other side of the street when it comes to superheroes, even after Storm, even after all the success over here, weirdly, there's, it's like, no, we, we, we're sticking to these outmoded archetypes, right? Um, I'm not gonna mention the movie, don't mention the movie, but I mean, again, his whole plot in the movie is that he's, he's object and wants the cure, right? It's like, really? Like, this is where we are, we're still, like, you can't ever learn to live with your disability, but that's what everyone in this room is doing, right? Unless you're perfectly healthy, which, you know, great. But for the rest of us, we're, we, we live with it all the time. We don't call attention to it. We don't talk about it. I mean, loved ones know, right? So the idea, and also that the world 
doesn't have a right to shun or you know push us into into any sort of corner, right? Um, and so again, I want to. So I opened with one black revolutionary, um, and I wanted to close um, with another um, because I wanted to, you know, um, sort of come full circle and say Victor Stone. I think overall is an important character. I mean, we see how important he is because he's in every damn thing, but um, he's also important. I think, and I think this is in part what was motivating them to create this character, right? I began to see Superman was a punk. That Superman didn't relate to replenishing the earth like Huey Newton and other real people do. In essence, Superman is a phony and a fake. He never saves any black people in this country in any comic book stories, right? But this is 1970. This is Bobby Seale, the Black Panther, writing his memoir of the movement. Again, I love reading things and finding comics in them, and I never forget them when I do. Um, um, this is his memoir of the Black Panther Party, and he's saying, hey, I realized that I was a hero and a far more profound hero than Superman could ever be, right? So there's a way in which, weirdly, the people who own Superman recognize that this is a problem, and so they created Cyborg to address the problem, but then they didn't invest the character with enough life, enough, weirdly, because this is quite clearly a, a political move, right? It's 1980, we need Black characters, let's create an interesting Black character. That's a, that's a, that's, Create that's creation driven by politics, but the, those politics only went those representational politics only went so far, right? And sadly, that's where they remain to this day. So, thank you.